You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Who Arted is turning three years old at the end of October. Please help me celebrate that milestone by telling me your favorite episodes from the last three years. Go to whoartedpodcast.com slash vote to tell me your favorite episodes and enter for a chance to win a $25 Amazon gift card. And of course, be sure to follow Who Arted on your favorite podcast app. I feel like who art Ed? Try to spice it. Who art Ed? <laughs> Mr. Wood art Ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's <laughs> ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me today, I have Natalie, one of the hosts of the Reframables podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Kyle. I am so excited to have you on today. One, because I always get excited with international guests, like getting to talk to people in other areas that I never would have met. I mean, you're in Toronto and I'm in Chicago. That's always cool. But also Reframables, I I really like the show because, you know, you've got this interesting hook. It's you and your sister talking through and sort of reflecting on different different issues through different lenses and coming from those different um, different worldviews and talking to other artists and writers, storytellers, and thinking about how the stories we tell and how we frame things really impact the way we perceive and experience the world. I love that. Oh, thanks so much, Carl. You know what? It really has been such an interesting journey doing it with my sister. I have been an educator for 20 years. My PhD is in educational philosophy, but my sister is a writer and producer and like her whole worldview is very much shaped by art on the ground, like in the making of it. And it's been a really interesting thing to do that together. And so I was excited to come on and talk to you because when you invited me to come on and talk about a specific artist who is you know, long gone, but very much present in terms of the way that she is shaping our interpretation of the day, uh, I just felt like what a beautiful confluence of of two different shows. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. And it's all coming together because you were nice enough to agree to talk about Hilma Off Clint, who is an artist that's been on my list to cover for for as long as I've been doing the show. It's been almost three years now. And I have wanted to cover Hilma Off Clint for so long. And you're the perfect guest because Hilma Off Clint is someone whose narrative kind of reframes the way I look at um, modern art and history. You know, mm-hmm. she she was avant garde. She was ahead of her time to such a degree that even though she was painting at the very beginning of the 20th century, it wasn't until the end of the 20th century that anyone really knew about her work. She was, um, as I said, painting at the beginning of the 20th century. And that's the early modern period. When we think about that time period, artists like Vasily Kandinsky and Piet Mondrian and Picasso were celebrated for their innovations in abstract art. I mean, Kandinsky Kandinsky bragged that he basically invented the category of abstract art, which is a ridiculous claim on many, many levels, Um, you know, you would have to caveat it by saying, well, he was the first abstract painter in Europe, you know, (laughs) like there were so many like qualifiers there, but even putting all of that in there, Hilma off Clint was doing it first. She was exploring abstract painting and she was exploring automatic writing and drawing guided by the subconscious doing all that stuff before the more famous European contemporaries. She was doing that subconscious automatic painting before the surrealists. She was making abstract stuff before Kandinsky. I mean, the term avant-garde means like going ahead of everybody else. Hilma of Clint is like the definition of going ahead of everybody else. So I always wondered, like, why had I never heard of her? Because I studied art. Like, I I went to school at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I studied art in a world-famous museum. And still, like, I hadn't heard of Hilma of Clint until a few years after college. It was probably like 2010, 2012, somewhere around there. Mm. It's easy to say, well, well, because she was a woman, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. we both know historically 
women have not gotten their due. No. Um, but I, I think it's also because in her will, she stipulated that all of those abstract pieces were not to be shown for 20 years. Um, she just knew that the the public wasn't ready for that. The public mm-hmm. wasn't ready to see and appreciate what she what she was doing. So those works gathered dust in her family's attic uh, for, like I said, 20 years. It was actually almost another 20 years. It wasn't until like the 1980s that she was really starting to be taken seriously. And they were putting together bigger retrospective collections of her work. Well, and that's so interesting that we consider those retrospective collections, because I think that there was something very forward thinking about her decision to actually keep her work hidden. I just think there was something so brave and self-aware, self-assured even in her own recognition of how her work could not be received by her peers. And that there was oh, like such a beautiful kind of optimistic hope for a future generation that they might have the eyes to see what she knew of her own kind of artistic story. Like what she was putting out into the world was, was worth not just sharing, but was worth exploring, was worth interrogating. And, but that it had to be the right audience to do that. And that that audience wasn't there yet. So she's like, well, then let's save it. And even if I'm dead and gone, which she was, then those that next generation would get to enjoy and learn. And there's that kind of retrospective dichotomy, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just think that's such a lovely reality to have played out. I call her one of my artistic mentors. And how can somebody be a mentor when they're so long gone? But I think they can. Well, yeah, because I mean, she's she's someone you can learn from. And mm-hmm. she was painting for the future. She she realized it wasn't going to be understood in her time, but that eventually it would. And I mean, that is a, that is some confidence and some courage. Mm-hmm. And I always love a story of somebody who is doing something for the sake of doing it. You know, she wasn't she wasn't making those paintings for for the admiration of others and to get those kudos she just Mm -hmm. she knew that it it was something she felt driven and compelled to make and I think there's something beautiful about that absolutely art for art's sake in like happening in real time yeah absolutely exactly and you know in in because we're talking so much about time I, I feel like I should be clear and concrete Hilma off Clint was born 1862. She's like the fourth out of five children. Her father was an admiral and a mathematician. Interesting combination there. Mm -hmm. And because of that, though, she spent most of her childhood at the Naval Academy where her father was stationed. But in the summers, they would go to an island on... I'm not going to be able to say this name right because I can't get any names right... Lake Malloran, not positive on that one. You I'm know, not she's sure in either, Sweden. but we'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, and she she just loved exploring nature. Um, that was kind of the the childhood experience that I I got. You know, she's out there, she's exploring, and she felt those ties to nature that would show up later in her work. She goes to school. She went to art school, the Royal Swedish Academy of Arts. Um, it's like Techniska Skolan. I don't know Skolan why. For I, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so she's taught to paint landscapes, portraits, botanical paintings. You know, this is the kind of time period where in the historical lens, you know, women, as we said, did not always get their due. Like women were not seen as the equal of men in European society, in the arts and stuff like that. Um, The fact that she was able to go to the art school is, you know, something good because Mm -hmm. because like in in France and Germany, they they had um, they didn't have an integrated school system. But while she's in school, we're talking like 1887 time period, um, you know, she's recognized for her talent and she's getting honors and awards and she makes a decent living as a painter. But 
women of that time kind of had to stay in their lanes. They mm-hmm. weren't doing the monumental historical paintings that were like the finest of the fine arts. They weren't getting those massive commissions, but she could do portraits and landscapes and she liked making sort of like botanical drawings and illustrations and stuff like that. And like I said, she she made a decent living as an artist, but she wasn't in that avant-garde art scene. Mm-hmm. And yet what's interesting to me was trying to imagine the story that was was playing out in her mind. Like just imagining the art that she was making for public viewing. And yet what was really happening kind of in the in the recesses of her, I don't know, do you want to call it like her artistic soul? Like what was she kind of like crafting for herself that she knew was starting to bubble up into like, what is my real form? Like it's thinking of like life as a writer, you have your, your stuff that you kind of will write for some smaller magazine to kind of pay whatever bill, but then you have like the novel that you're working on. (laughs) I I sort of associate it that way. Well, and I always think it's kind of cool that, you know, she's, She's getting to do the job that she likes to do, make a living off painting. But then she's got the passion pieces that are more just for herself, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. that she's developing this other stuff um, on the side. The other thing is, as you talk about, like, what's in her soul and what's bubbling up in her, I think that is a wonderful, wonderful segue to what she was doing and what makes this perfect for the spooky season. because. She was she was generating these new ideas and innovations in a collective, um, a group of women called the five. Mm-hmm. They would have seances, and she was she was the medium for the group. Now, today we think of seances as, you know, sort of occult stuff that a lot of people dismiss, but mm-hmm. In the 19th century, the spiritualist movement was very serious. I mean, mm-hmm. this was also the time period where the Theosophical Society was founded. Um, a Theosophical Society focused on trying to get like wisdom from different people and different religions, you know, regardless of race and gender and all of that. It was trying to bring together all the best ideas from all the different philosophies from all different people. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was more openness to these different ideas. And I think also when we think about just what the world was like at that time, I mean, this is the time of the industrial revolution. Photography was happening. That was something that was new and different. And very quickly with photography, those photographs became evidence of the paranormal Sometimes with like accidents of light and sometimes with manipulations of double exposures, you know, x-ray technology also came about in this time. It was like 1895 when people could like get x-rays and stuff seen at the World's Fair. So all of this stuff is out there that is just like blowing people's minds that, Mm -hmm. you know, like a little a little box can capture an image or, you know, you can see through to what's under people's skin. And so it seemed very believable to everybody that like, there's something more going on. There are these other dimensions and spirits that could be guiding us. And they were trying to explore those ideas. And I love the way that you frame that because we are, I would say human beings are inherently storytellers, but we're also, Um, There's a really wonderful thinker named Salvio, and she talks about being a story taker and not taking as in just for selfish gain, but the idea that I receive the story and then I take it and bring it somewhere else. And the artistic dimension of storytelling that we see play out with with Klimt is just so she she is doing something there with the seance work with these women, with this kind of storytelling and taking between each other and then going beyond that to the canvas. I just, I think there is a really human proclivity embedded in, in that act of them coming together as a community to, to try and make sense through story of the world that is changing around them in the midst of what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, in the midst of such a rapidly changing world, Mm -hmm. you want something that feels deeper, more steady, 
and you want this sense that there is some controlling element beyond the chaos, you know, yes. yeah, because yep. otherwise the 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 fast pace of change can seem overwhelming. And um, I think, yeah, yeah. And what I've seen um, is studies have indicated that, like, when times are more turbulent, people tend to gravitate towards arts that are a little bit more predictable and stayed in some ways like music with more predictable cadences and patterns tends to be more popular when um the world is a little bit more chaotic and when things are a little bit more stable and settled that's where people tend to gravitate more towards like music that is a little bit more experimental and unpredictable which i i found kind of interesting and yeah. I did not know that you just taught me something new, Carl. That's fascinating. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the fact that Hilma of Clint and others are seeking out this deeper sort of innate spiritual powers or however you want to talk about it, however you want to frame it. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Hilma of Clint talked about these high masters that guided her in these seances like i said she thought of herself as a medium and she began employing like automatic drawing she says that she said um because she's not still currently saying it at least not to me um <laughs> in somebody's seance <laughs> maybe she said that these pictures were painted directly through me without any preliminary drawings and with great force. I had no idea what the paintings were supposed to depict. Nevertheless, I worked swiftly and surely without changing a single brush stroke. I mean, that's just to me such an amazing way of working mm -hmm. and thinking about things. Um, mm -hmm. And if that is true without without a single brushstroke or a sketch to guide it. I mean, add us off to her just on a technical sense. <laughs> these are beautiful to, I know. to have executed them so well without, without a mistake. I mean, it's, it just goes to just goes to show that the Swedish education system has been spot on for some time. They were doing something right. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm staring. I, I don't want to jump ahead because I'm just excited to talk about art itself, but I'm staring at some of her work. And and I actually just wrote about um, one of her pieces to do with um, this is what human beings look like when they're born is the piece that I was looking at and the idea of like the birth of, of humankind. And it's almost impossible to imagine having done it in one go because the layer, the layers that sort yeah. of seem to get unpacked in her work but yeah I she's she's a, a source of kind of almost like consternation for me a little bit even though I call her a mentor because I feel like I can't do what she did <laughs> yeah. I want to strive for it but not on a canvas but with my words and and I don't know I don't know that I could maybe I just need to get into my seance circle with my girlfriend <laughs> and figure this one out <laughs> you know she definitely had had a serious talent and mm -hmm. Um, you know, the seance circle, I always find interesting too, because, you know, she, the seance circle, from what I understand, as I said, society was interested in seances around this time that the spiritualist movement was happening. But from what I understand, part of the reason that she became so engrossed in that scene and enamored with ideas of seances was born out of her own personal tragedy. Mm -hmm. Um, when Hilma was 18 years old, her 10 year old sister caught the flu and this would be a terminal illness. And Hilma helped her sister to accept this fate. Mm -hmm. And I just think like when you're dealing with that kind of a trauma, you have to think there's something more. You have mm -hmm. to think that that's not the end. And so after all of that is when we see her becoming a medium and joining that circle and making these these massive paintings that um i think after the break we will take a little bit of time to talk about
Now we're going to take a little bit of time to look at one of her specific pieces. This piece we're looking at is called What a Human Being Is from around 1910. And if you are listening on Amazon Music, Spotify, Pandora, um, you will see this image in the episode-specific cover art. If not, you can Google it or go to whoartedpodcast.com to see it. But as we're looking at this painting, what are you noticing? What's jumping out to you? For me, what I notice is the really dramatic spiral that kind of runs through the center of the circle. So it's a circular, it's a, it's a, it's a big sort of rectangular canvas, but with a massive circle in the middle. And in the middle of that circle is kind of like, I guess, a heart. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's this spiral that runs all the way from the bottom of the canvas to the top. And remember that her father was a mathematician. And I always find it interesting when art and numbers come together. And I'd seen it in some of her other pieces, but in this one specifically, I was really struck by what's, what just what struck me as very mathematical or, um, you know, skewing towards kind of like the sciences. And so it was this piece of engineering that exists in the middle of essentially a human heart. And if she's titled this piece, what is a human being? Does that say something to me about being many different things. Like I'm not just a soft heart that is sort of in love with the world, optimistic about what's to come about, you know, the future that lies ahead, but also very aware of the, of the um, circular nature of the day to day that sort of drives me through from where I start to where I end. And a one could decide because the, because that spiral goes from the top to the bottom. There's no sort of stop gap part so it goes runs right through you could decide that it's like going up or going down and so is this like beginning to end end to beginning i feel like that that seems to me very life right like it's yeah day in day out it's all happening constantly yeah i think that's really interesting um as i'm looking at this you know the the spiraling motion going down that central column i mean it it's almost an axis of symmetry, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and the heart and circle have like that feel of almost like a like a Japanese notan design or something playing with like positive and negative space. I mean, we see like one half it's a uh, pink heart and the other half of the heart is white and then surrounding the white is a pink circle and surrounding the pink half of the heart is a white circle. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that mirroring kind of interesting. Um, it, it reminds me of another piece I saw that she did with swans that were black and white and yeah. had this figure ground play that was almost like something Escher would do decades later. Mm -hmm. And as I'm looking at this, I didn't think of a mathematical connection. No, I thought okay. of... I well no I mean as you're saying it it makes perfect sense I the connection that I had at first was it almost looks like it reminded me of seeing like the the DNA helixes okay yeah diagrams like you know what I'm saying yeah absolutely but like the, again that would be way ahead of her time you yeah. know like that's that's not the kind of thing that they were seeing in in this at that time um, and there's something that just keeps pulling my eye towards the the color spectrum at the at the bottom like oh, in the circle yeah in yep. that circle there's something heavier about that like it feels like it feels like the heart and the circle towards the top it feels like it's radiating light mm -hmm. but then the essentially rainbow pattern at the base feels like there's this wave to it almost like it's a fluid or something heavier something more solid that's sunk to the bottom totally agree absolutely that's what i see too which I is didn't really think of the wave i like that and and that's really interesting because like when you think about it color literally is waves of light and mm -hmm. so if anything should feel light and bright and radiant it would be the color spectrum but yet they're heavy right she's yeah. made them heavy She's made it heavy, yeah. and that that spiraling sort of corkscrew 
seems to go through it, yes. right? It's yep. it's like that's the only thing that's opaque enough to obscure our view of that corkscrew. Yes, yes, yes. And interesting that as it spirals through the color, I'm looking at it more closely right now, and it feels to me like the colors are getting swept in with the corkscrew so it almost feels like are they going to now get dragged down and, and drain out like is there a draining thing that's about a drainage issue yeah. <laughs> that's what I see when I look really closely and maybe I'm maybe I'm misreading something but keeping in mind her her trauma and the loss of her the, you know, the eventual loss of her sister. And mm. I do my whole podcast with my sister. I mean, she's my best friend and she's the person I want to talk to about everything. Life's big hurdles, you know, big or small and reframe them with her. If this was in many ways, Hilda's way through, if this was her reframing action was to paint, could there have been some pain in in the weight of those colors that eventually was going to bleed out into the rest of her art. I don't know. That's what it sort of strikes me as. Yeah. And well, I think if I'm looking at this and trying to psychoanalyze someone that I've never met through their paintings, <laughs> yep. it it seems to me that a plausible interpretation is a reconciling of some, some trauma, but, and a moving past it because we see it's very different dark at the bottom i mean it's a deep gray black tone Mm -hmm. um but then as i said it feels like it's radiating light in in the top and Mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting how it's like blue and yellow on on the two sides there so it's it's almost like this complementary color scheme happening Mm -hmm. and the bulk of the painting is the light yes it feels like it feels like some it feels like there's this upward thrust to me. It feels mm-hmm. like it's it feels like it's filling up and, and moving past and radiating out and and overcoming that darkness. Mm. So I I read it as as a happy, optimistic tone. And and maybe this is because I'm the type of person who always likes to look at the good and yep. likes to assume the best about people. So I see this when I see what a human being is, I see that heart as radiating out and it is color and it is life and it is bursting forth. And it it is something that is overpowering and just waiting to be unleashed, mm. you know? And if you look at it through the lens of like overcoming trauma of, you know, the loss of a, a loved one, if you're putting it in that spiritualist context, I might almost think of it as, you know, this is the symbol of the soul that is released from the, you know, the physical body. That's beautiful. I like that. That's the way I I would read it. Uh, I, I mean... No, I'm yeah, loving I'm, that. I'm, I'm going to go with that. I mean, she. Yeah, I think you should go. She's with not that. going to come back and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I like that. And you know what? It's so interesting too about the reading of art, right? Is that we 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 might read a painting differently based on our own sort of energies on that day. And I mean, I imagine that she. I'm going to hope, anyways, that she would sort of smile at us reading her work today because she might say you know, when I did that, that day, I was really hurting, but then the next day I saw it and I felt better for having done it. I mean, who knows, right? Like there is the release, as you say, that, that kind of optimistic upward energy that drives the painting up. Maybe that's what she was hoping for us. Well, that, and I, I think she's one of those artists who maybe didn't even consciously understand the significance of her own work. And Mm -hmm. I think that happens to a lot of artists. I mean, Vincent van Gogh considered potato eaters to be his greatest masterpiece for, for some period of time. And when he talked about uh, the starry night, I think, I think he referred to it as a failure, Hmm. you know? I mean, like sometimes you're just as the creator, you're, you're in it. You Mm -hmm. can't step back and look at it with those fresh eyes. And I, I think she just felt compelled to create these things and, I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't fully understand the impact of it or understand all of the meaning to it or what was behind it. Just she intuitively knew that there was something there that she felt that need to create. 
Mm-hmm. And that's a part of literary criticism. I mean, not to sort of bleed two worlds together, but we know that, you know, reader response theory is, is, is very much a part of how we read literature and, you know, whatever the author put out there, yeah. it's what the reader takes from it that matters in the end. It's not like, according to that perspective, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter what the author intended. So perhaps there's something to be applied in terms of artistic, like visual art specifically here. Um, analysis. I think there's truth in all art forms for that, yep. you know. Yep. Um, anything else you want to say about this one? No, I'm ready for you to move me on to something new. <laughs> and I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The loo? Is this something to look at? The lab? the lab? Is this something to learn from? Or the loo? British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's a the loo joke in there somewhere. <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. Okay, well, for me, absolutely, this piece is for the Louvre. And the last time I was in Paris, I was, oh gosh, 25. So it's been, you know, I'm 44. So it's been a few years since I've gotten a chance to sort of wander through those galleries. And the Louvre is wonderful, but actually it's the Musée d'Orsay that I could picture this piece <laughs> sitting, in, sitting in there. And, and I, I think I would stand in front of this piece, just like I did with a piece by another woman artist, another mentor of mine, Rosa Bonheur, whose paintings look completely different. She was painting cows, right? I mean, like full on landscape work. But both of these women were, I think, ahead of their time. And when, if I were to see Clint... I think I would stand there in front of this piece and cry like I did with Bonnell's cows <laughs> when I was 25 and trying to figure myself out because there's something about a real sense of hope. Even though your eye was drawn up, Kyle, my, my eye was drawn down. And I think that I'm okay with that. I think that depending on where I would be in my own sort of emotional landscape, yeah. standing in a place like the Louvre d'Orsay or whatever, I would want to stare at this painting and just feel. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think it feels like a museum piece. It feels mm-hmm. like one that is for the ages and has some significance because it works on so many different levels. It has mm-hmm. that, it has that gut level resonance that, you just intuitively are drawn to and you can interpret it in different ways and everybody brings their own thoughts and connections to it. But I think there's also something more to it because art historically, it feels significant that a, a woman was doing this over a hundred years ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it gets me to rethink and reframe all of these different things things and movements in art history and trying to how do I categorize it how do I make sense of it and I like that I puzzle over stuff like that I like that I can have just that sensory experience of just enjoying looking at it but then I I can also think about it in the connections to what does it say about society what does it say about the the roles that some artists were confined to because of the structures of society of the day. What does it tell us about sort of the zeitgeist or the spirit of the time with, I'm talking too much about spirits, the spirit of the time with spiritualism, (laughs) but you know, it, it tells us a number of different things, you know, that were applicable to our understanding of the, the time in which it was created, but also just resonate and apply to individuals in our time for Mm -hmm. a a new audience it's always fresh and i think that is something special for an artist to create absolutely and i i I tip of the hat to her because she she did it well and i think the other thing that i i really love because you compared her to other artists you know talked about when I think about her compared to other modernists, mm-hmm. one of the things that's really infuriating to a lot of people about modern art and modern abstraction is it's just like you don't have an entry point if you didn't study this stuff. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And she gives us she gives us symbols that feel concrete enough that I think you can you have that entry point that's a little bit easier. But then there's more to there's more depth to it if you want to go farther. 
And I think that, again, is a difficult line to walk. Yeah, and doesn't that make her in so many ways, I mean, I guess from an educational perspective, I would call her like a pedagogue, right? I mean, like <laughs> she's she's someone who then was basically saying, I'm not just creating art for art's sake, even though that's how we started pondering her, but actually I'm creating art for a, for a future audience. Yeah. But then I'm going to have to welcome them in. I love that. It's just so... It's so not then just about the artistic ego. It's about bringing people into a conversation. And she does seem to have that way about her work. Yeah, it is it's it is a rare piece that is like 10 feet tall and still doesn't feel like it's about the artist's ego. You yes, know? <laughs> 100%. Absolutely. And I just think there's something really inspiring in that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm going to have to agree with you. And thank you once again, uh, Natalie from Reframables Podcast for joining me and having a wonderful conversation about an artist that I have come back to to look at so many times and enjoyed. And I've, I'm so happy I finally found the perfect person to talk to about it. Oh, Kyle, thanks so much for bringing me on. This was This was inspiring. I'm ready to go look at some more art. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.